four and a half thousand years ago, probably just north of the Black Sea, a language was spoken. This was on the cusp of the Neolithic Bronze Age transition, so these people had domestic horses and wheeled horse-drawn vehicles. They had agriculture, but they didn't have writing. They wrote nothing down. Uh, as far as we know, not a word of their language was ever written down in any writing system. So how do we know, for example, that they called this stuff Rekrao, that they called this Korawos? The answer is that we've been studying dynamic sound change in languages for something like 200 years, uh, and we've got a very good idea of uh, how sound change works and what the rules are, um, what kinds of sound change there are, what sounds are likely to turn into what other sounds. Um, and we also have something like, depending on how you divide them up, something like 450 modern existing languages descended from this one single Neolithic Bronze Age uh, language. Um, you know, so we have English, Welsh, Spanish, Italian, Romanian, uh, Polish, Lithuanian, you know, Icelandic, Punjabi, Hindi, you know, all of these languages are descended from this one great-grandparent language spoken probably north of the Black Sea. And we call this ancient language Proto-Indo-European because it's the proto-language of the Indo-European language family. Presumably they didn't call it that at the time. Uh, I think that would have been quite, a, quite an act of foresight for them to call it that at the time. But uh, we call this language Proto-Indo-European. Um, and I've talked about it a little bit in an earlier video. Now it's this mass of descendant languages and also our understandings of the rules of sound change that sort of allow us to triangulate backwards uh, and work out what this proto-language um, must have sounded like. We can reconstruct quite a lot of the um, phonological structure of words in Proto-Indo-European and we can do a pretty decent job of reconstructing uh, the phonetic realizations of those words and those sounds as well. Um, although there's, there's room for an awful lot of debate when it comes to the actual phonetic realizations. Um, so there are um, numerous acceptable ways of pronouncing certain Proto-Indo-European sounds. For example, this might be Aregwer, or it might be Chekwer. Either way, English ultimately comes from this language in an unbroken chain of parents teaching children, teaching children, with the language slowly evolving over time, over the course of about 4,500 years. So this video is going to be about an interesting detail in the reconstruction of this language. The way we reconstruct proto-languages generally is easy enough to understand in principle. We use what's called the comparative method. We look at all the descendant languages we know about and we compare them to each other. It's sort of analogous to the way an evolutionary biologist might compare species to each other to work out something about the common ancestor. Oh, that's focused. Sorry about that horrible noise. Um, there are a load of examples online, so I'm going to use a more colourful analogue from biology rather than a linguistics one just because it makes it easier to picture. Humans, chimps, gorillas and orangutans form a group known as the Great Apes. In general, humans tend to have dark hair. Chimps, bonobos, nor gorillas also have dark hair, um, obviously barring albino individuals. Orangutans have orange hair, so all these animals come from a common evolutionary ancestor. Now how would we go about trying to work out what colour the ancestor's hair was? Well, we go off the principle of, uh, let's assume as few changes as possible, let's make as few assumptions as possible. So on the face of it, this would lead us to the conclusion that the original ape had dark hair because it seems more likely that three animals adapted to have orange hair than that five animals adapted to have dark hair. Uh, but when you add in the relationships between these animals, you see it's a, a bit more complicated than that. So chimps, humans and gorillas uh, and bonobos form a clade, so we're all more closely related to each other than any of us are to orangutans. Orangutans were the earliest diverging lineage that still survives today. So if you wanted to split the great apes cladistically in two, the division would have to be orangutans on one side, humans, chimps, gorillas on the other. So now we have these relationships, we can see there's actually a 50% chance of a common ancestor having dark hair and a 50% chance of it having orange hair. 
if that doesn't seem right, think of it this way. So let's say the common ancestor had dark hair. We only need to postulate one change from dark hair to orange hair to explain the pattern we now have, which is orangutans having orange hair. Now imagine the common ancestor has orange hair. We still only need to postulate one change, this time from orange hair to dark hair, to explain the pattern we now have, which is this clade having dark hair. Both possibilities explain the reality we have equally well, and both of them only require us to assume one change has happened. Therefore, it's a 50-50 chance. Now, if you wanted to push that statistic one way or the other, you'd have to demonstrate, for example, uh, if, you, if, if, if you could prove that orange hair is more likely to evolve into dark hair than vice versa, then you could push the probability one way or another and get the actual answer. I don't know much about that. Um, so the comparative method is a linguistics version of what I've just described. Now sometimes sounds disappear from languages. Um, and a, a dynamic example of this you can see happening at the moment is um, uh, the dropping of huh sounds from the starts of words in certain dialects of English. So some people will say house instead of house or ohm instead of home. Um, and this, uh, you know, this has been happening throughout the history of English. There's evidence of it happening in certain varieties of Old English. There's evidence of it in Middle English, and obviously we know about it in Modern English. Um, but uh, a more complete example of it is in Spanish, where every h huh sound from Latin in, in standard Castilian Spanish has disappeared, although some of them are still written in, in, in writing. Um, some of them are still sort of appear in the, in, in, in the spellings of words. Um, well, what if Proto-Indo-European had sounds that disappeared in all of the descendant languages before any of them were written down or recorded in any way? Would we have any idea that those sounds existed? Would we be able to reconstruct those sounds in Proto-Indo-European if they left no reflexes in any, any descendant languages that we had? record you know records of um, and if not wouldn't that make us wrong in our reconstruction of proto-indo-european wouldn't that make us quite far off um, well in the 19th century a linguist called ferdinand de saussure noticed a strange inconsistency in the way certain vowels manifested themselves in indo-european languages so usually vowels in languages that are related to each other correspond to each other in a systematic way but this inconsistency was uh, very hard to explain. So, for example, you have the Vedic Sanskrit bhati with a, but then you have two related Proto-Germanic words for the yana, and also fadorna with long o and short a, respectively. This is very hard to reconcile with what linguists know about the vowel alter alternation system in Proto-Indo-European that we call ablaut. So Sewer provided an explanation for this, that there was something we weren't seeing in these words that was affecting the vowel qualities, something invisible to us that was uh, dragging the vowel qualities uh, in strange directions. Um, and what he proposed was, well, when you pronounce certain consonants with the tongue very far back in the mouth, that can actually affect the articulation of the vowels around those consonants. So try saying kh and then a, kha, kha, kha. It's not too difficult. Then try saying kh and then i, chi, chi, chi. You can actually hear when I say it. There is a transition where the tongue is moving from the kh position to the e position, and you can actually hear that in pronunciation. It's an awkward combination of sounds to make. Chi, chi, chi. Um, now, in language, a lot of sound change happens because people, for want of a better way of saying it, pe people slur their speech, people talk in ways that are mechanically easier for them. Um, and in a, in a situation where you have a backed consonant, a backed fricative consonant like kh, followed by uh, a vowel like e, which is very far away articulation-wise from that consonant, you will often get a... Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you'd call it a simul uh, assimilation in that context, but you'd get something like assimilation where the vowel was dragged towards the position of the consonant. So something like e or e would become more like a. Ah. So bearing that in mind, Saussure came up with the explanation that there might have been three 
or maybe more sonorant consonants in Proto-Indo-European that disappeared in all of the descendant languages before any of them were recorded. Um, and that these sonorant consonants might have uh, affected the vowels in the way that we now see in the modern descendant languages. The first of these sonorant consonants would have been neutral. It would have had no effect on the vowels. The second would have had the effect of dragging vowels towards the <coughs> ah, towards the ah position. And the third would have had the effect of dragging vowels towards the or position. When combined with what we know about Proto-Indo-European ablaut rules, so vowel alternation rules, this made an you know this made a whole range of things in the modern Indo-European languages make a lot of sense that they hadn't made before. But I hear you protest. Um, if those sounds don't correspond to anything solid in any of the descendant languages of Proto-Indo-European that have been written down or that are still spoken, is it not just all? Uh, a big just so story, you know, is it not just a story we've made up to fit the evidence? Um, and so Sewell's idea was, was dismissed as a just so story for quite a long time. Um, and what you would really need to prove that those laryngeals has existed is obviously either written proto Indo European, which we don't think existed because they had no word for writing, um, or we're not able to reconstruct a word for writing, or a written descendant language that had what we call reflexes of those sounds. Sorry, someone's doing some construction work. Um, a written descendant language that had reflexes of those sounds, so consonants that had descended from the laryngeals. And what we found when we decoded the Hittite language, which was an Anatolian language, was that it was an Indo-European language spoken a very long time ago, and it had reflexes of those laryngeal sounds. That's very, very annoying. Um, <clears throat> it had reflexes of those laryngeal sounds. It had backed consonants that were in the exact places you'd expect the laryngeals to be in Proto-Indo-European, the exact places Saussure had predicted the laryngeals would be in Proto-Indo-European. And this is, I just wanted to explain this to you because it's a very nice example of the predictive power and the explanatory power of historical linguistics, even in situations where... Um, there were not solid reflexes of sounds um, on record when an idea was devised. Uh, a later discovery proved those sounds to have existed. So I just thought that was interesting and would be worth sharing. Um, there's debate about how exactly those three sounds might have been pronounced. They must have been backed consonants because they dragged vowels towards backed positions. Uh, and the third one must have been uh, rounded, with, that is pronounced with rounded lips, because um, it dragged vowels towards being rounded. Um, but aside from that, there are, there are a few potential sounds that have been suggested as to uh, what the laryngeals might have been. Um, and here, here on the screen are a few examples of those suggestions. I suppose the real answer, my friend, is blowing in the or oh, wentos 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 windows 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 wind 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 wind